Okay, well, let's get going. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of those of you who are able to join us today. My name is Marie-France Paquet. I'm the Chief Economist at Global Affairs Canada. And today I'm wearing an orange sweater instead of a jacket to visually mark the first National Day of Truth and Reconciliation in Canada. So I am joining you from Ottawa, Canada, which is on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. So today we have a great panel for you on supply chains. So it wasn't so long ago that actually supply chains were only of interest to a few specialists. <laughs> but over the past 20 months or so, supply chains have been under the spotlight like never before. We've heard about challenges in producing and distributing PPE and vaccines that save lives, and the regular reports of shortages of critical inputs that keep our economies working. So it is in this context that we would like to share some of the work that is going on to show how different groups are thinking about supply chains. Part of the title of this forum is actually resilience and one that is reflected in the title of this session. So we will hear about you know, different fields and different perspectives, the speakers and the organizations that they represent, how do they assess vulnerabilities and also to work you know, uh, to build resiliency in the supply chains. So it is important to know that given that we are virtually <laughs> at the WTO, that there will be a focus on international supply chain. But I think it is also important to state that this focus on international supply chain should not be interpreted as international supply chain inherently being more vulnerable than domestic supply chains. In fact, in Canada, we've seen a lot of disruptions in domestic supply chains in the first and second waves. Uh, so research actually by the OECD found no evidence that economies would have fared any better during the pandemic in the absence of international supply chains. And research has often shown that there are a few key steps to building resilient supply chains, and the order of our speakers today roughly follows those steps. So we will hear, particularly from our first two speakers, about frameworks and data that are being used in Canada and the UK to gain additional insight into supply chains and how to identify risks. We will hear about strategies for building resilience uh, into supply chains. Resiliency being defined as the ability of supply chains to resist disruption, but also about recovery. So of course, once you've, you have a supply chain that has been disrupted, how fast and how well can you recover? So we'll introduce quickly the speakers, but please note that their full bios are available on the W to public forum website. So we will begin uh, our presentation this morning by Aaron Sider, who's the director in my team at the Office of the Chief Economist at Global Affairs Canada. Aaron is one of those specialists who has been working in this field for many, many years, way prior to the pandemic. So he will describe the work that has been done in our office on establishing a framework and tool for analyzing potential choke points and vulnerabilities in international supply chains for Canada. For our second presentation, we have Philippa Makepeace, another specialist in the field. She's the Director for Global Supply Chains, United Kingdom Department of International Trade. So Philippa will present their approach to building supply chain resilience post-pandemic, discussing how they utilize various frameworks to assess supply chain, to uh, identify vulnerabilities, and also how to create mitigating action to build in resilience. Then we will have a presentation by uh, Chindima Ifepe, She's the Director of Business Operation, Africa Medical Supply Platform. So we will hear about the Africa Medical Supply Platform, which is a digital procurement marketplace and how it connects African governments to vetted global suppliers as part of maintaining supply chain. And then we will hear uh, from a very different perspective. So Karina, Karima Catherine Gonzian, she's the CEO of Red Dot Digital Inc. and B2B Match. So Casey will bring the private sector expertise or perspective to this discussion. Uh, she will describe her company's role in providing a platform for small and medium-sized businesses to make connections and identify suppliers. So after this presentation, we should have a few minutes for questions if we are disciplined. And without further ado, I will turn the floor to Aaron. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mary France. Um, as Mary France mentioned, I would like to begin um, this session by showing some of the work that we've done in the Office of the Chief Economist at Global Affairs Canada. 
Um, what I, I am going to present will be, um, so, as Mary Frances described, one of the first steps in understanding and building resilience, which is understanding potential vulnerabilities and the frameworks that we've developed and the data that we've been using to do this. Um, and I think uh, an important um, element of what we have done is that it is easy, relatively easily rep, um, something that can be replicated in other countries. Um, and so we'd like to share that with you today. So the first thing to think about is what are we talking about when we're looking at supply chains? And so um, from a uh, government economy wide perspective, and so it often begins with something that is produced externally. And as, as noted, I, we're from um, Global Affairs Canada. So our focus has been on international supply chain. So we start with the foreign producer of the intermediate input. It crosses a foreign border. It uses a transportation method. It crosses the Canadian border and it arrives at a Canadian industry. Um, and each one of these stages is a potential area that could um, be vulnerable to dis um, disruption. Um, this is of course very simplified. There are of course many inputs coming in both internationally as well as from Canada. And importantly in our method, we also think not just about things coming in, but also um, the downstream as well um, as going um, what goes abroad either to other um, economies or to the rest of the Canadian economy. So if we first focus on, in our method, we focus on the Canadian industry. Um, and to do that, we use something called input output tables or often commonly referred to as supply use tables. And for those who are not familiar, these are statistical tools that are produced by many statistical agencies that describe all the inputs that are coming in to an industry, both domestically as well as from foreign sources, as well as the outputs that are coming out of the industry, both to the domestic economy and to the global economy. Importantly, for the international trade element, we were able to use very detailed HS um, codes. This is the standard harmonized system codes that provide a, quite a bit of detail on products. And using this information, we built a international supply vulnerability index, which has five elements um, to it, which are the reliance on intermediate inputs, um, direct imported intermediate inputs, the um, indirect imported intermediate inputs, the geographic concentration of imports, and also a special piece that we did on um, imported limited supply products. Um, more information is available on our website for that. In addition, we have the international demand vulnerability, which is a little bit more simplified looking at basically similar elements, but on the other side of the equation. So we take these various factors and we built a index of vulnerability of supply, which rates an, um, each industry of the Canadian economy from low to high vulnerability based on their score. And we combine that with vulnerability to international demand, um, again, from low to high. And we can plot these on a graph just to visually display this information. Um, and broadly speaking, in the bottom left-hand quadrant, you will find the least vulnerable industries. And in the top right quadrant, you will find the more vulnerable industries. So we can then graphically display all of this information. And this very complicated looking graphic um, represents the entire Canadian economy, each bubble representing a different industry um, and the size of the bubbles representing the size of that industry in the Canadian economy. And its location on this as previously described is a rough estimate of um, where we might find more vulnerable industries. In addition, um, when we were doing this, we, as thinking back to the graphic that I displayed at the beginning, um, we wanted to also look at the modes of transport and ports of entry. So we took the same information and I can't display it all on the same graphic because there's just too many dimensions. Um, but we see here, um, just as an example, the modes of transportation or the downstream vulnerability 
as well as for the upstream vulnerability. And in Canada's particular case, we are a very large geograph geographic country, um, but thinly dispersed over the North United States border. And so a lot of our industries are very reliant on cross-border truck traffic. And you can see that, um, that in the yellow color where most industries rely mostly on truck. Um, and then you can see that there's others that are on sea transport, air, um, rail, and others. So how do we think about this? If we think back to this original diagram, um, again, very simplified, um, we, we of course do not have the perfect information. So we cannot look into that foreign um, country to see um, where inputs are coming from, but we can see as it leaves a foreign border. So we can see a product, for example, um, which identify which country it is coming from. We can then see that what mode that product is transporting on as it goes towards Canada. We can see which Canadian border crossing it is using. And through each of those, we can identify, um, for example, um, if there is a problem at a particular Canadian border crossing, we know which products might be affected and then which industries use those products. And then again, of course, I'm only displaying one side. We then can do that on the way out as well to foreign markets. So this of course sounds quite interesting, but we have to note that there are caveats as well. So it does provide a structured framework. It is based on hard data, which we think is very important to um, add some actual structure and quant quantitative measures around these things. Um, we have very practical uses in terms of seeing um, which industries could be vulnerable products, modes of transport and ports of entry or exit. But we also note quite a number of caveats which are, are listed here that we unfortunately just do not know everything that we'd very much like. Um, so with that, I will end my presentation, but I'm happy to take questions in the question and answer period. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aaron. So yes, indeed, feel free to uh, submit a written question and we'll try to uh, address them at the end. So um, let's go over to uh, Philippa, if you can share your screen. So Philippa is one of those other experts like looking at data and frameworks. So let's hear the UK perspective on this. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I'm gonna share my screen in a little bit actually, because um, I can start without. So um, thank you very much. And thank you, Aaron, for that really interesting presentation as well. I'm really pleased to be here today and this topic's really important to us and I'm really happy to share one way we're looking at it. Um, I wanted to start actually by referencing what focused both our attention and the attention of governments around the world on supply chains in the early days of COVID-19 pandemic with those un unprecedented demand spikes for certain medical items, including personal protective equipment and the ensuing need to secure supplies, which led to challenges in the supply chains we relied on. Some proved robust, whilst others were really severely impacted by both demand and supply side events. And our experience through that period confirmed to us that while building resilience in supply chains is complex, and I think Aaron's presentation shows just the beginnings of that complexity, and there's no one size fits all plan, it does rely on maintaining the free flow of international trade, and it's best served by nurturing open societies and economies. Um, import, uh, imposing export restrictions or trade barriers um, are just not going to be the answer. Um, so before I talk more specifically about how we've been assessing and supporting the resilience of supply chains, I, I wanted to mention the G7 activity in this space. Um, under our UK presidency this year, partners reaffirmed the vital role trade plays in ensuring we recover from the pandemic, um, agreed the need to ensure that multilateral trading systems are reformed to be free and fair for all, more sustainable and resilient, and also welcomed the OECD paper on economic resilience, which uh, was commissioned for them with thoughts on how to promote a level playing field. And actually supply chain resilience was a focus for this year's G7 economic resilience panel with discussions on areas um, for potential cooperation, including establishing critical supply forum, sharing the outputs of nationally run uh, supply chain stress tests, 
promoting visibility across supply chains and promoting fair and just labour standards. The, the final report containing the recommendations will be published in autumn this year, and I would recommend people take a look at it. Um, let me see if I can just share my screen now. Uh, give me one moment. Great. That's great. So um, I guess global supply chains, and Aaron's kind of shown this, are some of the most cross-border and interconnected elements of international trade. We consider that it, resilience comes from diversifying supply rather than aiming for self-reliance, and that cooperation between open integrated market economies can help create more resilient and effective supply chains. So I'd like to take you through one way we're doing this. Uh, let's see if I can get it onto the next slide. Oh, Mary, Cla Mary Francis worked when I last did this. It's going to be really annoying. Ah, perfect. Sorry about that delay. Um, so we focus on three areas. The first is strengthening visibility and understanding um, of the supply chains. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail. Then looking at the policy levers um, which strengthen those supply chains and then supporting international efforts more broadly. And I wanted to flag some principles that I think you'll have picked up from earlier in the conversation which is that um, global supply chains um, are very much seen as a sort of source of strength and resilience. Um, we are not suggesting that these need to be brought um, uh, reshored. Resilience comes from, um, uh, sorry, resilience comes from um, really important um, effective trading systems. And importantly, we choose the minimum intervention where we can. I'm also really pleased to say that the approach that I'm about to talk you through closely aligns with the recently published OECD report outlining the keys to resilient supply chains. Those keys highlighted by the OECD are part of all the tools we use, um, looking at anticipating risk, minimizing exposures through domestic policy, building trust through public-private collaborations, and keeping markets open through international cooperation, trade facilitation. So, Understanding them, what do we do? So the first thing we do is look at the criticality. And this is slightly different, I think, from the way uh, Canada was just describing it. We, we really get into the detail of, of which supply chain matters to the UK as our, as our first point of uh, call. Um, we assess it using a framework uh, which draws out a number of factors, including perhaps uh, relevant human health, um, impact on the economy, and using that framework, um, we can look at the impact of a disruption caused by a shortage of the product and importantly, rank it against others so that we can look at the absolute um, crucial top ones. Um, not all critical supply chains will necessarily be vulnerable. So the first, after working out which is critical, we then have a look at vulnerability and whether there is an inherent risk within that end-to-end -end supply chain. Um, that has, uh, currently done on a very detailed basis through supply chain mapping and uh, assessing it against the vulnerability against five stages of the supply chain, which you will have also seen, I think, in Aaron's presentation earlier. Um, where we identify a supply chain as both critical and vulnerable, we work with the lead government department within our system to develop long term plans that help to mitigate the risks and vulnerabilities which have been identified using the following pillars to focus action. These four pillars can be applied separately or in combination, depending on the sort of vulnerability you're trying to mitigate. So the first is diversify, which is, um, I think it does what it says on the tin, look for new suppliers, look for new markets, and ensure that you've got, um, in its effect, the uh, not all eggs in one basket version of um, supply chain resilience, really looking across the piece at where else you might be able to get supply into that particular supply chain. The next is partnering with close allies and collaborating with international partners so that we're working with uh, other governments to prevent export bans and improve trade facilitation. The third is creating strategic reserves um, of critical raw goods or uh, critical raw materials or goods 
And, um, you know, we will have seen stockpiling where that makes sense uh, to protect against future demand spikes. And the final pillar that we look at is whether or not, where appropriate, long-term opportunities to strengthen supply chain come from increased domestic production. As I mentioned before, our starting point, because we know it works effectively, is market first. We know that breaking down barriers to trade can encourage businesses to diversify their supply chains, helping to build resilience and aiding the post-pandemic recovery. But it is important that we look at all options and apply an appropriate mix of global and domestic sourcing. We know that the global market has the capacity to withstand disruptions and ensure greater resilience. And we also know that carefully targeted interventions and incentives can help create the resilient supply chains that we need to prosper today and in the future. So we aim for the lowest intervention needed and keep that focus squarely on supply chains, which really are critical to the UK. As I mentioned earlier, our approach is aligned with the OECD, OECD's view on how supply chains can be resilient. And we want to continue to learn from other countries and their approaches to these issues. We greatly appreciate the discussions we have bilaterally and at events such as these to learn from each other's experiences and to inform responses to our shared challenges. I really look forward to the discussion that's coming. Thank you, Marika to France. Thank you very much, Philippa, for this uh, comprehensive approach. Very interesting. So let's turn to uh, Chinima. So she will, of course, present a very uh, different perspective in terms of um, real kind of real time issues and how they went about solving it. So Chinima, what do you? Thank you very much, my friends. Um, greetings to everyone on the call. So I come from an organization known as the Africa Medical Supplies Platform, and it is a very young um, organization. When uh, the pandemic started, or when, you know, when Africa started getting its first cases of the pandemic early on in 2020, what the leaders quickly realized was there were no stockpiling of diagnostic kits or clinical management devices Basically, what was happening at the time is, you know, there were so many risks around the sourcing. There were inadequate supplies of PPEs to support the frontline and community healthcare workers. There were also a shortage in uh, diagnostic kits. And we will get into my presentation shortly just to discuss a little bit more about what we saw on the ground and how the African Medical Supplies Platform is currently supporting government and government related agencies to mitigate against supply and procurement risks. So if you will give me a moment, I will just share my screen. Um, thank you. So while my screen is coming up, one thing I'd also want to really start looking at is just to also paint a picture around you know, what was happening on the continent just around uh, the period of March, 2020 and uh, the period of between the period of March, 2020 and June, 2020, when the AMSP was launched. At the time, well, I mean, I'm speaking particularly to diagnostic kits. At the time, um, sourcing on the continent was happening you know, through most of the known UN agencies. And at the time, uh, the WHO consortium had come up with a quota management system to be able to you know, fairly distribute the scarce available resources to all member states. I mean, most of you might be familiar, but at the time there was um, a very, I mean, the productions were not, um, they, they hadn't scaled up at the time. So there were really, really small quantities available for a huge demand, uh, as you can imagine. And because Africa was already arriving into the market pretty late, um, later than most of the Western countries and the Asian countries, we were left with, you know, scrambling with what, you know, was available or what had not been bought or paid for at the time. Now, specifically speaking to numbers, um, sometime around May, we had around 10 million kits that had been acquired for 55 African Union member states. And the 10 million quick kits was supposed to you know, be utilized within a 16 weeks window. So if you, you know, do the maths and do the numbers, 
it really came down to around 45,000 um, kits, that's tests, not the kits themselves, 45,000 tests that were available per country, you know, per month, so to speak. And given that in parallel, the Africa CDC was urging member states to increase testing as one means you know, to be able to quickly trace and track the infection, we quickly realized that you know, that particular availability wasn't going to uh, speak to, to, to the need of Africa to scale up testing. About that time, the African Union chairperson at the time, President Cyril Ramaphosa, had mandated that you know, we set up a system to be able to diversify the current procurement structure and scale up a procurement and availability of critical medical supplies. Supplies. I seem to be struggling to get my, my presentation on the screen. So maybe let me just give one minute to my France, if you could <laughs> help me or Michael to just pull that up on the screen. That might be, that might be helpful. If you want to just speak, oh, yeah. yes. go ahead. Okay, I'm not sure thank you why very much. Sharing. Okay, thank you very much. So at the time, you know, we created the African Medical Supplies Platform and there were really seven key terms of reference. We wanted availability of medical supplies. We wanted immediate access to them. We also wanted, you know, good quality and certified supplies. We wanted them at the best cost. And let me stop here because countries in the Southern of Africa, at the time they were purchasing N95 masks at $29 a piece. Um, but when we looked at the pool procurement pricing, that we were accessing them for, we were getting them for about two to four dollars a piece. So we were seeing a lot of price gouging, and there were there were you know arbitrage that were that were being created at that level. Um, another term of reference that was particularly important to us was to ensure that the manufacturing capacity of the African continent was represented on the platform. So we were also providing the platform for African suppliers. And we had simplified payment processes, as well as um, um, making sure the logistics and uh, uh, the delivery was pretty straightforward. So the African Medical Supplies Platform was launched in six weeks. Um, everything from planning to you know, go live, all of that happened within six weeks. And we were able to, by the end of December 2020, process over 20 million um, items, and this included um, personal protective equipment, clinical devices, diagnostic kits, and, and some other products, including medication. Now, just to give you an example of how you know, the process was working for us, sometime in August, one of the bigger, one of the, one of the bigger projects that we handled was to procure and distribute the medication, the drug, dexamethasone, to all 55 AU member states. So at the time we were, I mean, at the time we had also, there had also been multiple releases of its efficacy um, against helping, you know, um, hospitalized patients with, you know, helping to speed up the recovery process. So we were going into the market with established um, organizations. So one of, the, one of the key things we did at the time was to really partner up with donor foundations and suppliers uh, because that was the sort of that was that was the better way to approach ensuring that you know Africa still got a share of uh, of the materials uh, and the covid requirements so we had after you know partnering up with the donors we then had to transport products you mean there was a long <laughs> transportation journey it came from Newark we had to pick it up from JFK when I mean when we flew up when we flew those drugs from JFK we took it to Ethiopia where we had to repackage into smaller quantities and from Ethiopia we did the last mile distribution to all 55 um, member states in saying this, uh, what I really want to highlight is the possibility of leveraging partnerships in times like this, to really build agility in the supply chain structure. And I think one of the things we have been doing concisely and really deliberately is leveraging the ecosystem and the current marketplace to, to, you know, to, 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 to get access, not just you know, preferential access, but to get adequate access 
for African Union member states. Um, unfortunately, my slide hadn't come up. What I wanted to show um, all of you on the call was just also what it looks like when we started the first um, deliveries. It's just an image showing the boxes of, of, of uh, our 14th shipment that was going out to Rwanda. And just to wrap up, I, I think the, the, the point for us today and, and the message you know, for us is it's possible to build agility in res and resilience into existing supply chain systems. But I believe what, one, one, thing that, you know, one thing that we have done well was really leveraging partnerships. I mean, because we came into a structure that was already struggling with you know, insane demand and a very, very low production capacity. So partnering up with you know, organizations that were already doing similar, similar, you know, similar procurement, similar distribution and deliveries really boosted up um, sort of the work that we are doing and helped us in creating as much impact as we have had uh, on the African continent, as well as the Caribbean community. So I'm just going to stop here and hand over back to my phones. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvima. So I think a very um, interesting experience and I love uh, your, um, your, the terms of reference as you call them, right? Making sure that even like African suppliers were not crowded out by this, you know, bigger suppliers or uh, abroad. So very, uh, very interesting. So thank you for that. So we will uh, go on to um, Karima Catherine Houdian, so to show us some potential avenue for solutions now that we know all about the problems too. Um, what can you share with us, Stacey? Thank you very much, my friends. And I'm going to immediately share my screen. Um, and I'm very happy to be the last one to go and to represent the, um, uh, the private sector. But what I've noticed in all the presentations, there's so much synergies um, that we can create together. And you will see that a lot of it resonates in my own presentation. So um, let me do this. So while I'm uh, setting up, uh, I'd like to um, introduce myself. I'm uh, uh, Casey Gundian. Uh, I'm based out of Toronto in Canada. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Red Dot Digital and uh, B2B Match. Red Dot is a strategy uh, firm uh, that was established in 2006. Um, based on my so, and based on my experience running Red Dot, um, so, so, yeah, sorry, <laughs> uh, not 2006, uh, 2014. Um, based on my experience uh, running Red Dot, I created B2B Match, a business matchmaking platform catering specifically to small and medium businesses that provide services and products. Um, we launched three weeks before COVID. It wasn't done on purpose at all, uh, but it was just literally um, fate. And what happened is it made the platform even more relevant. Uh, so we've had a steady growth and uh, what um, all the previous uh, speakers said, um, partnerships was major in our growth, um, not only with major business organizations and also with industry specific associations. So I'd like to show you a super quick video about the platform, then we'll get into uh, the meat of it. Okay, so excellent. Um, 
So a little bit of um, the backstory around why we created B2B Match. Uh, so as a service provider based out of North America, I was trying to build a business not only locally, but also internationally. I ended up for the past, uh, for the two years prior to um, building B2B Match, I was traveling pretty much every three weeks out of the country. Uh, I also joined uh, membership associations, business associations, and my ROI was pretty nil with regards to building, uh, to, to bringing in business. Um, business organizations are traditionally um, very focused on events and are very untargeted, um, unless you pay a very high premium, which you know, is very inaccessible to smaller uh, organizations. So online business to business tools also exist, um, but they're mostly specific to specific industry or niche markets and are manual. Um, it also became very clear that a lot of the support systems, so government and other granting bodies, was mostly geared towards products and manufacturing based organizations, not services, even though we hear that service is the biggest chunk of the economy in many countries. So, uh, with that, uh, as a business and as a service business specifically, I wanted to find a way to help not only myself, I wanted to also be able to help the service industry and provide companies a new way to diversify their supply chain. After one particular experience uh, of being told that I couldn't be helped because I didn't sell uh, tables and chairs, um, you know, I came back home. And I you know, brainstormed and the idea of B2B Match came about in May, 2019. So it's like a baby, nine months later, it was born. Um, so what B2B does a bit differently from all the other platform is uh, we use an algorithm. So it's an AI, but also there's a human side to it, which resides in the vetting, the marketing and amplification of the membership companies. Um, we bring visibility to a company that joined the platform um, and also emphasize on discoverability, because as we know, specifically in the procurement system, you tend to use the same kind of people or the same people all the time or the same firms. So we really, what was important to me when building this uh, pro project and building this platform was the discoverability aspect. So people are matched by an, an intelligent algorithm that knows what you need. Uh, additional features uh, increase um, on platform engagement. So we have a messaging uh, platform. We also are working on a workflow um, and we're building uh, more features as a conference center, event and uh, member management uh, that will be geared towards uh, business um, organizations and even more that uh, we're working on and launching very, very soon. So if we look at um, our contribution to the supply chain, um, so as we know, you know, supply chain is a series of dependency and problems can arise at any given moment. Uh, everything from sourcing to production uh, to shipping. So what B2B uh, Match allows us to do is to reach out to companies that can help you, give you more options to connect with alternatives for each of the points of the supply chain. Um, in time of crisis, as we've seen with COVID, you may need to pivot your business or create a carefully uh, planned communication um, strategy. You might also have to explain delays to your customers and B2B can connect you with businesses that can do that as well. So on the platform, we break through barriers uh, to insular industries, and I will give an example uh, a bit later, and sub-industry, so camp companies can discover and diversify the resources, talent, and suppliers they can, you know, they may be able to work with, not only locally, but internationally. We also make the process as equitable as possible, because there's no picture on the profiles, um, just business logos uh, or banners, we are encouraging businesses and business owners to base their decision about what companies to hire in a way that is as unbiased as possible. The platform contributes to the diversification of supply chain by capturing data points uh, related to women-led businesses and other underrepresented groups. So we also have a very strong international scope. So all the base out of Canada, from day one, we were an international platform. 
um, you know, our reach have been growing super quickly. Within a year, we've had um, members from over 40 countries and 100 industries. Uh, the platform is now available in English and French. Um, it's kind of fantastic, specifically in the short amount of time we've been alive. <laughs> um, but because, our filtering, because of our filtering capabilities, you can do business next door or in any of the 40 or plus countries that are represented on the platform. Um, the platform member demographics include big organizations, uh, small ones, women-led, governmental bodies, and so on. So in terms of um, um, you know, the partnership, which is really interesting is um, individual companies can become members independently, uh, but we gain most of our members through our partnerships. Uh, and that echoes what uh, the previous speakers have, uh, have said. Uh, we partner with Business Chamber of Commerces, uh, Association. Um, we, we, we basically welcome anybody who feel like this could be an amplification or augmented um, um, addition to the services they're providing to their members. Uh, we are also in talks with government partners uh, to uh, implement the solution. So as you can see, we, uh, we, cast, you know, we, we grew our partnership through the International Chamber of Commerce, which is quite a big you know, heavy weight with regards to partnerships. Um, also, we have uh, a Canadian Women Chamber of Commerce. We have a Francophone um, Chamber of Commerce. We also um, very recently, uh, we're bringing on um, the aerospace industry into the platform. Um, and that's another very interesting um, partnership for us through uh, the or, um, Ontario Association and Ontario Aerospace Council in Ontario, Canada. Um, we've, had, we've worked together to actually build a platform uh, that will be giving um, access uh, to aerospace companies and connects industries to an, a hub for aerospace globally. Um, and that, that's super exciting and it's launching in a couple of days. Um, so what is the strength of the platform is truly also the data insights that we have. We capture, uh, we capture data from member profiles companies about anything from the location, the language, but also their objectives. Are they looking for leads? Are they looking for partnering? Are they looking for funding? And we use the, those data in, uh, points to um, not only inform our own strategy, but also help our partner network uh, to um, to, to inform their own strategy and potentially build programs specifically, for example, this one called NYX. Um, and it has, and this is a, a little bit of an exclusive for you because it's launching uh, very soon. Um, we use the data insight we had around women-led businesses, women-operated businesses around the world to launch a new program, um, which will deliver insight about businesses that are women-led, owned and operated, so that funders, and other major institutions can appropriately target uh, those organizations for more support and more targeted support. So in conclusion, um, services often have no borders. We know that, um, and specifically with digitization, but they still require market knowledge and opportunities. Uh, B2B Match uh, helps companies do that exactly locally and internationally. Uh, in these times of global supply chain disruption, um, or you know, our ability to connect across borders, find specialized help in our target market, and pivot our businesses is crucial to staying afloat and mitigating supply issues. B2B Match is a key tool to help with all of that. So thank you very much for the organizer. Thank you, Marie France, um, and thank you for my fellow speakers as well for all the resonating key messages that we heard. Uh, if you have questions, please don't hesitate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Casey. So um, I hope this has given you a good and broad perspective on how to go from finding a real problem. Is it a real problem, the issue of criticality that Philippa was talking about? So if you know supply chains are vulnerable, is it critical or is it not? And if it is, then of course, then building resiliency will be done a bit differently. So principles are important. Information is key. 
Right? We've seen the, the principles from uh, Chim Dima also, like how to go about building something. And of course, love to finish on a positive note of how to uh, find tools that are actually already existing and make the best out of it to eventually, you know, be better prepared. But also, um, Casey, in your presentation, I think it was quite nice to see uh, this idea of um, uh, it could be a tool to diversify supply chain. So definitely in Canada, it's something I've always, you know, discussed with, with my team and say we have multitude of SMEs and they tend to be on the small side of SMEs. And do they have good visibility into their own supply chain? And do they know if they have a critical component in their supply chain, do they have alternatives? Do they know where to go, right? If one supplier is, is shutting down because of, let's say, natural disaster, what have you, right? So your tool uh, allows uh, as well for, for that in terms of building a bit more diversity into one supply chain. So fantastic, um, fantastic uh, tool for, for that as well. So I invite you to submit comments or questions if you have any. So and we'll push that to the floor. Um, so I think um, uh, we'll start with a question, uh, Chindima, um, to you. I don't know if you can see it, but basically, uh, so what you've presented, of course, is it was built in the context of the pandemic. So you decided to build the plane as you were flying it in a perfect storm. Um, and, and you've been quite successful at that. So is there any thought in terms of um, expanding this idea? So going beyond, let's say, medical supply for the African Union, for example. Any thoughts behind, given that it's been quite successful? Thanks, Marie-France. Um, I mean, maybe what wasn't clear in, in that presentation was we started off as that initiative to support the, you know, the member states um, with the sourcing. And what I'd like to use this, use this medium to share is the scope of the platform, we have expanded it to include the Caribbean committee. So today the AMSP doesn't only support government in Africa, but we are also supporting government in um, the CARICOM. And this is evident with the, the African Vaccine Acquisition Task um, Trust Vaccine Acquisition Strategy. They have procured 220 million COVID 19 vaccines, and they are using that medium to support not just African Union member states, but the CARICOM. That said, we are also expanding the scope of the platform to move um, into non COVID you know, supply related. Uh, 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 related healthcare uh, um, support. So what this means is in the mid and long term, we will be diversifying the current scope of work on the platform to further support the, 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 the government as well as um, primary healthcare institutions with grant scale um, sourcing. We have also, we have, we've started a path to ensuring that we have really good access to non-profit pricing, um, similar to what you see with some of the bigger non-governmental organizations such as UNICEF. And we have also started recording a good number of interest from some of these last mile um, healthcare providers that are requiring, requiring not just a COVID related materials, but non-COVID materials. So we do see that the MSB is slowly but certainly expanding to provide you know, critical support and, and for, 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 you know, for procurement that are not or only restricted to COVID. So yes, <laughs> in the short term, that would be the answer, but I just wanted to use that medium to sort of also expand that scope and expand how, and, and explain how we are also supporting the CARICOM. Thank you, my friends, and over. Thank you very much. So yes, I, I, I think from all the presentation, if we can, if we, if I had a, just a few words to summarize it, I would say l'union fait la force. <laughs> and we've seen how we, we need to bring in different uh, players in, into this, different partners, uh, collaboration is key. Uh, so that, that, would, that would be something that come to mind for me in terms of trying to summarize best uh, the approach going forward. Um, but if I, if I can go back a minute to um, providing assessments and, and, and this idea of you know, criticality and principles in, in order to build resiliency, um, Philippa, from, from let's say the UK's perspective, what would have been, what, what would you say is the most difficult thing to do? Like it's always, you know, it's nice when you when you have the data, let's say you can do some analysis, but from your personal experience and in, in going from 
assessment to you know framework and mitigating action what what is the most difficult uh, portion of it well that is a great question um i think th throughout actually it's the level of complexity that you can get into with supply chains so you can you can decide that a product is is critical pretty easily actually in terms of um, if you've got a decent framework, understanding how it might impact the country if it didn't exist anymore, if there was a shortage, I, that has an element of sort of, it's fairly clear one, one way or the other. It's, uh, certainly there'll be gray areas. But actually in that, in that supply chain mapping aspect and understanding not just the kind of um, initial supply chain, but actually who's supplying your intermediate producers and who are they relying on? Because I think what, what we have found in some of our assessment is that supply chains can on the surface look quite resilient. If you get down a couple of layers, you find that everybody's sourcing back from the same company um, because you know that, that's how uh, these things operate. Um, and so you can get a bit of a false sense uh, sometimes of, of how that is unless you start to dig into it. And, and that digging takes takes real time and real expertise actually within our analysis function. So I would say that's probably one of the trickiest bits, understanding it well enough uh, and speedily enough, uh, given given the, the challenges we have. Indeed, timing is, is of the essence in, in these cases, right? So, I mean, ju just a comment here, but in, in terms of um, from an association in Canada called Supply Chain Canada, I've heard a gentleman say, and you will know that the, the secretary said, you know, it takes 10,000 parts, let's say, to make a car, but it takes one part not to make a car, right? So, in other words, that's it. When you, when you start digging down and, and realize the complexity, and to your point about, oh, maybe you have a few players sourcing from the same company abroad, and, and that is part of this. Uh, this uh, first is the visibility. Do companies have good visibility into their own supply chain? Do they know the potential choke points? And do they have a plan B, right? Some of the small companies might not have, let's say, a logistics department very you know, um, well-staffed, let's say. And it could be a question of uh, five or six people in, in, in to run a business. So it might be a bit more difficult. Um, and, and then going back to uh, Casey's kind of potential solution. So if you have a tool to help you out, can you find elsewhere another supplier of, of a particular good or, or even a service, right? Um, it is, um, it, it's fantastic. So I'm told some people, like at least one colleague of mine has issues with, with so many questions. So I hope people are not uh, having difficulties. Um, but um, I, I wonder, um, Aaron or any other uh, panelists, if you have a question for another uh, presenter, um, I've used my I've abused a bit my presenter power, but <laughs> I'll open the floor if you have another question. Well, I'm going to take that opportunity um, and ask a question of Aaron, if I may. Um, it's it's really very interesting seeing the approach that Canada takes to that that mapping aspect, and I'm just interested to know what that that next step is once you've got that information and you know where the vulnerabilities are what's the next step for um, mitigating within Canada uh, thank thank you very much that's an excellent question um, honestly quite a complicated question um, because it, it really depends on the situation so um, from our perspective at Global Affairs Canada it's really depend it depends both on on the industry the product what is what is the situation that's been identified? Um, so I can use um, a fairly concrete e example to, to help answer that and to kind of give an idea of how the tool could be used. Um, so um, as, as an example, one can see there was a situation in Canada where there was the potential for a disruption at um, a port of entry. And so, um, we, we were very quickly able to use this tool to identify um, what products cross through that port of entry um, and therefore what industries could be impacted and where were alternative supplies possible or alternative ports of entry. Um, so in the first instance, the, the addition of information was the most powerful tool because it allowed one to prepare and adapt. Um, but then the second is that 
each type of disruption might require a particular type of intervention because in this particular case, it wasn't a specific product, it wasn't a specific sourcing, it was really just part of the chain. Um, and so it, the, the simple answer is that it really depends on the circumstances to um, what, what is identified as the nature of the, the difficulty and how one um, could uh, um, adjust or uh, how one adopts to that situation. Um, but if I can use my moment of, of speaking and ask uh, a question of KC, um, now, Mary France, please interrupt if there, there's an urgent question, but if I was going to ask KC uh, more specifically, um, so can you give some examples of if, if, a com if there's a company that, for example, has a, um, either a challenge that they have a short-term supply issue or they're just looking to diversify their suppliers, um, how would your tool be used in that particular circumstance? Thank you very much. That's actually a really good question. So, um, the the point of so what what happened is we we were going to go in on mar in market with a paid platform. So we're going to have like a, a regular subscription based model, and then COVID hit. Right. So I looked at around I looked around me, and most SMEs were either closing or had lost most of their contracts. So the, the, you know, <laughs> the landscape looked a bit grim for a while. So we decided to completely uh, pivot and go um, and make the, the platform free for SMEs. Um, and at the time we had organization, business organization that were interested in actually having access to paying for access to the platform. That's how we pivoted our revenue model. Um, so the platform became free and accessible for any SME, any company in the world. We have big organization on the platform, but any company in the world can sign up. And when they sign up, they, uh, they choose, um, not only do they choose uh, the kind of services they're looking for. And when I say service, I'm talking about professional services go ranging from accounting all the way to wellness and performance as we saw that was important during COVID and anything in between, including logistics, shipping, uh, legal, you name it, anything. Uh, as I mentioned, we have about uh, over hundred industries and those organizations that sign up, they fill up a profile. Think about it like a dating profile for companies. So they actually say that, you know, they provide information around what industry they're in, what sub industry they're in and so on and so forth. And that wealth of information is how the matching works is let's say your company in someone asked me yesterday in one of my demos, you're a company in Georgia who's making wine and you'll, you know, you want to export well on the platform, you would be able to match with somebody who is, who might be a distributor or an agent uh, or so on and so forth. That's how it would work. Does that answer the question, Aaron? Oh, uh, I forgot. I forgot to say that once you find that um, company or companies, because you have multiple matches, you're able to actually filter them with compounding criteria. So you might say that company, I have now 15 opportunities to connect with those companies, but I'm really looking for a company that is maybe women led and that speaks French and German. And that also does this and also does that. So that allows you to really find the gem that you're looking for or have a wealth of opportunities. Thank you, Casey. That's really interesting. And it's what economists would call trying to fix the asymmetric information problem, <laughs> right? So um, I don't see any uh, uh, questions coming in and into the, to the system. I've been receiving, you know, receiving some uh, messages saying it's, it seems to be difficult, but um, I think we're about to run out of time anyway. So I do want to take this minute just to thank our panelists today. So I think you've, um, you've had a good perspective from really playing with the data to providing the frameworks of how to look at this, um, provide evidence-based analysis as opposed to just hearing massive supply chain disruptions that everything's imploding. No, it was not. We had huge spikes in demands around the world for very specific goods. And, and, and we keep on seeing some of those. Um, and as I mentioned to you, some of the um, biggest issues we've had in Canada was on 
domestic supply chains because of lack of workers or a breakout of COVID in an industry or factory and, and so on. So, um, so I hope it's given you a, a, a good idea of how to go about it and definitely an excellent example um, from our friends at the African Union and, and potential uh, tools as, as solutions that, as Casey just pointed out, can go well beyond trying to fix a shorter term uh, problem finding a specific supplier. So I hope uh, this was useful to you and I thank you very much for joining us uh, today, uh, wherever you were uh, on the planet. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.